Greetings, everyone. Normally, I'd be sending you greetings from Florida, but we're in Pennsylvania, so I'm looking out the window at the melting snow, which is uh, quite different from what we're used to. But um, nice to be up here with family and uh, and be able to travel a little bit. As I mentioned to David, we're getting ready to crank up. And while the schedule sounds a little bit crazy to some, it's actually kind of getting back to what we call normal with conferences and travel out of state and that type of thing. So what I'd like to do this morning is I wanna to turn to two places in scripture. Um, the first is in the first chapter of the book of Exodus, and then we're gonna be turning to the book of the Revelation, but I wanna begin by turning to the book of Exodus in chapter one. And Matt, you can hear me okay? Good deal. Exodus chapter one. And if you turn there in your Bible, I just want to read a few verses. Uh, beginning at verse six, Joseph died and all his brethren and all that generation. In verse eight, there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. So um, we have a situation here in the, in the book of Exodus where uh, it was the change of a governmental administration. And it was a change in governmental administration from a governmental administration that had been friendly and uh, beneficial to the Israelites under Joseph and the Pharaoh at that time and so on, to a new government administration that was hostile and adversarial to the people of Israel in this stage. And as the people of Israel had increased in number, the king uh, Pharaoh saw this as a threat that possibly this large multitude of people would begin to unite, perhaps even join in a coalition with their enemies around them, whatever it was, it really was a false charge because it says in verse 11, therefore, in other words, this was the reason for them doing this. And we know that that never had been the intention of the Israelites and wasn't anything that they were uh, up to. So it was a false charge. And on the basis of that false charge, you'll notice a number of words that indicate the increasing severity of how the Israelites were dealt with. Uh, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them in verse 11 with their burdens. Verse 12, they afflicted them. In uh, verse 13, they were made to serve with rigor. Uh, verse 14, they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and serving with rigor and great difficulty. Now, you and I, who are believers, have the advantage that we know the rest of the story. We know that it was God's purpose to deliver the Israelites from out of Egypt. We know that uh, he had a purpose and a plan for this people. But had you been living at that time, and in a sense, you didn't know the rest of the story, uh, you may have even been questioning, well, where is God in all of this? And to tell you the truth, things got worse before they got better. They got worse to the point where at one point, the children of Israel basically say to Moses, look, you know, paraphrasing, knock it off. I mean, we had it better before you started all this. And now you've made Pharaoh mad and our labor's increased and it's more difficult and it's harder than we had it before. And then it got even worse. Then Pharaoh said to the midwives, listen, whenever a male child is born, um, you were to take that child and, and, and kill that particular child and cast that child into the river and so on. And uh, whether the child would have died by drowning or the crocodiles of the Nile, either way, the end result was the same. And so it was a very difficult time for them under this new administration. And yet, behind the scenes, we know 
that God had a bigger purpose and a plan for them that was going to be executed at the right time to ultimately deliver them out of the land of Egypt and from under the bondage of Pharaoh. Now, having said that, it sure didn't look like it. And so with that in mind, I'd like to turn to the book of the Revelation, and I'd like to turn to the end of chapter 11, if you're following along in the Bible with us, chapter 11 and the very last verse. And before I read that verse, which is chapter 11, verse 19, let me mention that I was taken by a statement that I heard recently. And sometimes I've joked that, and you may have heard it before, uh, originality is the ability to conceal your source. But um, I don't mind giving credit where credit is due. And it was actually John MacArthur I heard make this statement. And at first, when I heard him make it, to me, it was a very startling statement. And the statement he made was this, that you and I, who are believers in Christ, the church, we don't win. And I, it stopped me in my tracks to think about it. And then you begin to think of verses in scripture that say, well, wait a minute. We're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith, and so on and so on. But he went on to complete the statement. We don't win now. And I began to think about that statement. And in my own thinking, I added to it, not only is it true that in the big sense, we don't win now, but a lot of times it doesn't appear like we who are believers, the church as a whole, are winning at all. And I thought about it even in light of recent events here in the United States and change of administrations and so on. Um, I'm getting to the point in age where I often joke with the young people now that I think I might be getting close to, I'm not quite there yet maybe, but I'm getting close to the point where some people could call me an old man. Now, be that as it may, I am old enough to remember growing up in the United States, a world and a culture and a country that was quite different from what we find ourselves living in now. Younger people who are you know, very young and just growing up, they will never be able to appreciate what it was once we had in this country as far as our liberties and freedoms and a country that in large part um, was friendly towards Christian things, if not outright promoting of certain Christian things and values. And so those of us who have known that, it uh, is painful to watch those things be taken away or to evaporate or all the rest. However, uh, I was reminded in talking with a group of folks recently who were lamenting the fact that in Canada, certain people are being arrested and heavily fined for meeting together as Christians, uh, gathering together as a local church. And they, 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 on the other hand, I had to remind them, they've never enjoyed the constitutional freedoms and liberties that have been granted to the church, to us believers, under uh, our citizenship in the United States. But having said that, it really, we're beginning to, to experience in measure what has been true around the world for 2000 years. For the most part, around the world and other countries, what we now consider in the United States as abnormal has been the norm for them with governments that have been either hostile or certainly not friendly towards the things of Christ. And so um, when we think about that, we, we realize that as things get worse and worse, 
as uh, we await the time when the Lord Jesus will return to receive us unto himself. We don't know how long that'll be, but certainly it doesn't seem like in our country things are going to improve as far as things being more and more friendly towards the gospel and Jesus Christ and his truth. Having said that, that while it appears like many times we aren't winning, and while in truth we may never win down here on planet Earth, you and I have the privilege of knowing uh, what Paul Harvey used to call the rest of the story. And so that's very beneficial, isn't it? So with that in mind, let's look in Revelation chapter 11, and I'll read selectively beginning at verse 19 of chapter 11. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Now, I understand a, a number of the complexities of the book of Revelation, and um, I'm not uh, here to try to oversimplify anything or to try to overcomplicate anything. But one of the things that's been a great help to me in the study of this book is something that I had my eyes open to a number of years ago by uh, David Gooding in his approach to the book of the Revelation. And it appealed to me, and it's been a help ever since. And what it is, is that when you notice the major sections of the book of Revelation, each of those sections begins not so much with a chapter and verse mark like we have, but with some thematic thing, theme, that is something that occurs. And what it is that introduces these sections to us is like what we have in verse 19, something is opened in heaven. And when something is opened in heaven, there is seen some aspect of the tabernacle or of the furniture of the tabernacle, which helps us again to, if we understand the tabernacle in the Old Testament, because it was a pattern of things in the heavens. And when this particular item or whatever it might be is seen uh, in the open heaven, that particular thing then becomes a control that helps us to interpret what is taking place in that particular section of the book of the Revelation. At least it guides us to see what the theme of that section may be or what some of the bigger themes may be in that particular section. So in this introductory verse, which I take to introduce this next section of the book of Revelation, going on down into the first few verses of chapter 15, what is seen is the Ark of his Testament, or the Ark of the Covenant. And that is made to trigger something in our thinking. What then is the significance of the Ark of the Testament or the Ark of his covenant? And we remember that those two tables of the law that were placed ultimately inside of the Ark of the Covenant, one of the three items that was there, uh, that were there, um, that the very first tenets of that, the very basic truths of the covenant that God enjoined uh, with the children of Israel when he made them a nation back in Exodus 19, beginning there, that one of the very basic things was, number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And very closely related, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or the earth beneath or the waters under the sea. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children, even unto the third and the fourth generations. I am God exclusively. You'll have no other gods before me, and you won't make any image or any likeness of anything that's in the heaven above, earth beneath, waters of the sea, 
you won't bow down yourself to them nor serve them. And it's interesting that many of the nations that surrounded Israel and had some knowledge of uh, Israel's functioning and structure and so on, often referred to the, to the tabernacle as the imageless temple. They at least got that part of it right. And so when we begin to think of that basic concept that is communicated in that covenant, no other gods before me, don't bow down yourself to the likeness of anything that is in heaven above or earth beneath and so on. You know that we're going to come in chapter 13 to a time when not only is an image made and not only do people bow down to worship it in direct violation of that covenant that is introduced in 1119 here, but they will direct that worship not only to the beast, but to the dragon who is behind the beast. And so uh, we see then in this section what is beginning to take place. The throne of the beast and the ground upon which he demands to be worshipped. Which if we were looking at this in its connection to other parts of the book of the Revelation, perhaps would throw our thinking back to another scene in the second section, the throne of God and the grounds upon which he is worthy to be worshiped. And many of you would know immediately if I were to say, well, tell me what was it that is there proclaimed that makes the lamb worthy to be worshiped? And you would say, among other things, perhaps, you know, he's worthy to be worshipped. Thou art worthy, O Lord, because thou was slain. And it's interesting to think that in chapter 13, that the beast, John says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded or as it was slain in all the world began to wonder after the beast. And so the contrast, but I know I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself there. So what I'd like to do now is to look into chapter 12, because chapter 12 sets the stage for what will follow in chapter 13. Now, one of the difficulties of chapter 12, at least as I see it, uh, one of the difficulties of chapter 12 uh, is, first of all, as you begin to move through chapter 12, there are things in chapter 12 that have to do with things that happened in the past, things perhaps that are occurring now, and things that are yet to happen in the future. And sometimes those are combined even within one verse as we have it. So it becomes a little bit tricky to uh, move through, and, and at least it's a job for us as in interpreting the scripture to know what it refers to, past, present, future, or so on. I'm not going to get into that in great detail today, not the purpose, except to say that one of the other difficulties in chapter 12 is the difficulty of the book of the Revelation as a whole, and that is, of course, it is a very highly symbolic book. And another challenge for us as we move through the book of the Revelation is to ascertain which parts of this book uh, that are mentioned are purely symbolic or which parts use symbols to convey something far greater, deeper, and fuller. And so with those things in mind, I, I would like to add as well, it, it raises in my mind at least another question, why does God use symbols at all? Why doesn't he just give a straightforward language? Why is it so often in the book of the Revelation that the Lord Jesus Christ is not referred to as the Lord Jesus Christ. He is referred to as the Lamb. Well, is not God trying to stir up something in our thinking to make us think of him in that particular aspect? As a matter of fact, to me, one of the beauties of the book of Revelation is that I would title it uh, for, for one purpose, the triumph of the Lamb. 
which raises all sorts of thoughts, doesn't it? To think about how is it that a lamb can be triumphant? And of course, the book of Revelation helps us to understand that. But be that as it may, the Lord apparently uses symbols because he wants to stir our imaginations up. He not only wants to feed our intellect, he not only wants to stir our hearts and our emotions, he not only wants to challenge our wills and our volition, he wants us to use our imagination to begin to think about some of these things. And he paints pictures for us, but he paints the pictures with words, words that convey certain images to us. And so let's move through a little bit and begin to think about some of those word pictures that are given here and what it suggests to us. In chapter 12 and verse one, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, traveling in birth and pained to be delivered. Now, as I said, there are many things in the book of Revelation that are not the easiest to understand. And one of the values of studying the book of Revelation is it forces us to look into other books to see what is being talked about there. But on the other hand, there are many things that we can sort of get hold of. So I suggest to you that if you don't know who the woman is, clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and crown of 12 stars, if you have not even the slightest clue of what that might mean, you certainly perhaps can understand what it means that there was a woman who was with child and she's in the middle of childbirth, labor pains are taking place and she's about to be delivered. That is the child is about to be born. Now I'm gonna to suggest to you by way of cross-reference that you might wanna look at Genesis chapter 37 and listen to what Joseph has to say there in verse nine and so on about the woman and the, and the, and the moon and the sun and the stars and so on. But imagine the scene, if you will, here's a woman and she's at that point where her child is just about to be born. Now, even if you've never had a child, and I confess that I would fall into that category, I've never personally you know, delivered a child, although we have children, but as my wife will remind me, I don't know what it's like to have labor pains, you see, because that's such a severe thing. But even if you never have had labor pains, you can understand that a woman at that point where that child is about to come into the world, I doubt you could find a more vulnerable time when that woman is, in a sense, helpless, if you will, because she can't focus on anything else at that point. She is, in a sense, almost defenseless at that particular point. And that's what we see with this woman here. And right at that time of her most vulnerable moment, standing in front of her is another wonder, a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his head. Now we're not left to wonder because in verse, um, in verse nine, the dragon is identified as that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So at the very moment that this woman is about to bring forth this child, this hideous figure, a great red dragon standing before her, ready to devour the child, as it says in verse four, as soon as it's born. And the very moment when he's ready to devour that child, in verse five, she brings forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. No question, but that is the very son of God, the Lord Jesus. And at that very moment, when it seems like Satan had won, that child was caught up unto God and unto his throne. And what looked like a defeat turned out to be one of the greatest victories, if not, I would dare say, the greatest victory that has ever been accomplished. Out of that cold, dark tomb where the body of the Lord Jesus was placed, he rose from the dead. He not only rose from the dead, 
he ultimately ascended up through enemy territory, spoiling principalities and powers through the very air, which is the domain of Satan, and ascended to the very throne of God, where he's seated now. And Satan, his first attempt here that we see, he was frustrated. What he tried to accomplish was not achieved. And so, part two. There was war in heaven, verse seven, with Michael and his angels. And they fought against the dragon, the dragon against the angels. Now listen, I don't know what that might have looked like. I mean, we kind of have an idea what war on earth looks like. What did war in heaven look like? But it raises another question, doesn't it? Why was there war in heaven? Why would God allow there to be war in heaven between Satan and Michael and the angels? And I don't really have time, and I don't really have a full answer about that at this point, except to say it is at least interesting to think about. But the point is that the great dragon in verse 9 was cast out into the earth and his angels with him. The accuser of the brethren is cast down. Now, Satan, as I believe the scripture teaches, was the highest of the created beings as Lucifer. And he was above all of the other created beings. So high was he. And he's a very powerful adversary. He is described here as the accuser of the brethren. He accused them before God day and night. How'd you like to know that Satan would be accusing you before the very throne of God day and night, nonstop? But listen. Accuse them as he might. They, in verse 11, they overcame him. Imagine that, that if you're a believer in Christ, that great adversary who deceives the whole world, that enemy of God and of mankind, of human beings, you can overcome him just like they did. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. They overcame him by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. They overcame him. And once again, he was frustrated in his efforts to accuse and wipe out the very people of God. And so now, in the third part of this trilogy, he turns his attention towards that woman who I will just tell you that my view of that woman, of course, is the nation of Israel. It is her that brought forth the, the one who is going to rule with a rod of iron and of which J Joseph alluded to in his dreams back in the book of Genesis. And when the dragon in verse 13 was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which had brought forth the man child. And the woman was fled into the wilderness. And then in verse 15, the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood that he might cause this woman to be carried away in the flood. But the earth helped the woman, opened her mouth, swallowed up the flood with which the dragon had cast out of his mouth. And for the third part of the trilogy, the dragon was frustrated in his attempts, in his persecution of that woman to destroy. Israel. And then, because he was wroth, he went to make war with the remnant of her seed and those that, and listen, keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which links us in our thinking back to where this was introduced with the Ark of the Covenant, the commandments, the testimony, and so on. Now in chapter 13, having been frustrated on those three fronts, as this is presented to us here in these chapters, Satan then moves to engineer his, his greatest battle, if you will, 
he, he moves to, to cause uh, to be engineered the rise of this one who is called the beast, who many refer to directly as the Antichrist. And he rises up, which I believe is probably going to take place in the middle of the seven-year period of tribulation. And let me just say this right now to all who might be listening, whether it be by way of recording or whether it be currently under a live Zoom meeting. I believe from my study of the scripture that really the next great event on God's calendar is the taking out of this planet, uh, the church, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and what we sometimes refer to as the rap rapture, the removal of the church from this earth. And then after whatever period of time, there's going to come this time of great tribulation, tribulation seven years upon this earth. And I just want to tell you that if you're saved right now, I don't believe you're going to be there to experience the events of chapter 13. If you're not saved, you need to be saved right now. You need to come to Christ and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's your really only hope that you're not going to have to go through that time of which the Lord himself said, uh, looking down the halls of history, the annals of time said, there's coming a time on this world of tribulation such as this world has never seen. You think of every war that's ever been, you think of every famine that's ever been, you think of every pandemic that's ever hit this world, and there's coming a time such as this planet has never seen before. It's yet to come. You need to be saved. You need to know Christ as Savior now so that you're ready if the Lord Jesus should return today, tonight, or whenever he might. And so now begins the rise of the beast. And you notice that uh, the beast in verse 3, John makes this assessment. He says, all the world wondered after the beast. It was like the whole world had gone mad. And they're all wondering after the beast. And he goes on to elaborate. Verse 4 of 13, they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who's like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given him a, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy and so on. What a time this was in John's vision, you see, as he sees this. All the world is wondering after the beast. All the world is going after the beast. All the world is worshiping the beast. And then beginning in verse 11, another beast comes up. And when John sees this beast, he looks, and at first, it looks like a lamb. But if you listened, it was the voice of the dragon. And this one performs all sorts of wonders and miracles and makes fire come down from heaven and deceives people who dwell on the earth for the purpose and intention of causing them to worship the beast and to worship the image of the beast. And there again is the tie-in with what we were introduced to with the Ark of the Covenant and the Ark of the Testament. In verse 15, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. You see, really what is playing out at this juncture in history is what is really the greatest battle that has taken place down through the ages. It's going to culminate in climax in a future day. But it is the battle for the loyalty of the human heart. Who will win the loyalty of the human heart? Because really, when you think about worship, which is mentioned in chapter 13, perhaps more than it is in, in hardly any other chapter of the Bible, worship has to do with the loyalty of our hearts. To whom are we loyal? To whom do we bow down 
and pledge our allegiance, if you will, and give our allegiance to? It's a great question, isn't it? And how would the, would the human heart, how would it be won? You see, a dictator is perfectly happy, if there's a dictator, uh, to force you to express your loyalty, even at the point of having to, to enforce it by whatever means are necessary to get you to show your loyalty. And the beast and behind him, Satan, this false trinity of the beast and the false prophet and Satan, they're willing to do whatever they can to force you to bow down and worship them, even at the point of, of the threat of death and extreme torture and situations. Is that what God is like? And you see here one of the ironies, don't you? That this one who's called the beast, who is engineered by the dragon and, and, and empowered by the dragon in that sense, who ultimately will rise up and he'll sit in the temple and he'll show himself as God and he'll demand to be worshiped as God. He will exalt himself above God or all that is called God. And how will God win your heart? Well, if Satan's man is going to exalt himself and demand to be worshiped, the Lord will humble himself. If Satan's man is going to rise up and declare that he is God, the Lord will come into the world in the fashion of a man. And he'll humble himself. You know, take upon him the form of a servant. And he'll be obedient even to the death of the cross. And I dare say that if your microphones were unmuted and I were to ask you who are believers the question, what is it that causes you to be loyal and to worship the Lord Jesus? I don't think you'd tell me that, well, because he demands it or else he's going to kill me or he's got a rod over my head. And he's going to beat me if I don't show my submission to him. I rather think you'd be saying, you know, it's the Lord Jesus who, even though he knew me and he knew I was a sinner, he came into this world and he did what he did on that cross and he died the death that he died because he wanted to save me and God who loved me that much, I, as feeble as I am and as, as imperfect and weak as I am, I want to be devoted to him. I, I want to give myself to him. The son of God loved me and gave himself for me. And it is that that moves me to want to express my loyalty and my trust and bow to him in worship and own him as my Lord. It's not a forced thing, is it? And so the whole world that had gone mad, and then you find that he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, bond or free, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads that no man could buy or sell. And I'll tell you, during this time of about a year of this pandemic, um, it's been worldwide. And, and one of the things that keeps ringing through my brain is this verse here. No man can buy or sell. Whoever thought we'd see a time when whole nationwide economies were shut down, when you as a business were told you can't have your business, when you as a church were told you can't meet as a church, you can't function, you can't make money, you can't buy, you can't sell. Now, I'm not saying that this is that. But I'll tell you one thing, this that we're living in, it may be part of the Lord's wake up call to at least say, you know, that stuff I talked about in the book of Revelation. Well, guess what? <laughs> it's real. 
and it's going to happen one day and you get a little taste of it now. Nobody could buy or sell without a mark. I heard Bill Gates six months ago saying, you know, really what we ought to have is a, a sort of a vaccination passport so that if you're going to travel from state to state, from country to country, you have to show evidence that you've been vaccinated. And of course, the easiest way to do that would be to implant some sort of microchip or something, you see. And your, your mind begins to think. I'm not saying that that is this. I'm only saying, you see how the setup is already there. It's already in place. Now, the number that they are to receive is the number of a man. The number is 666. There have been books and reams of paper written on what exactly that number might or might not be. But another thing I find in the book of Revelation is that of all the things that we don't know and are unsure of, sometimes we look so hard to figure out the things we are not told that we miss the things that we are told. And so whatever that number might be, 666, we know this, it's the number of a man. It is the number of a mere human being. And that at that point, men stoop to the place where they would take a mark in their hands or in their forehead, which is simply the number of a human being of a man. And they bow down to worship the beast and the dragon who's behind him. No wonder John said, the whole world has gone mad. And then we have what I consider to be one of the most beautiful scenes and perhaps all of the word of God. As John turns in chapter 14, he looks just when he thinks all the world has gone mad and he sees standing in Mount Zion, the center of God's government on planet earth, a lamb. <laughs> and the lamb wasn't alone. He had 144,000 with him. And the 144,000 did not have the number 666 in their foreheads. They had his father's name written in their foreheads. And they began to sing. There was a great voice in heaven and harpers playing harps and singing a song. These are those which were redeemed. And once again, if your mics were unmuted and I were to ask you folks who know a little bit about the scripture, what is the basic concept that is conveyed by redemption? Well, you wouldn't be too far off, would you, if you said, well, it means to purchase. It means to buy. But wait a minute. Chapter 13 said, no man can buy or sell. But these are those which were purchased. They were bought because you cannot stop God's redemption program. You can't stop it now. You can't stop it in the future. The gates of hell will not overcome or prevail against it. Just when it seems like the world's gone mad, here's 144,000 that God has purchased with his name implanted in their foreheads. And then we're told a little bit about them. What were their characteristics? Well, verse four, these are they which were not defiled with women. They are virgins. In other words, these are they, and they haven't taken up the normal, legitimate pursuit of life for men. They've pursued something else. They have pursued someone else. It isn't a violation for a man to marry. That isn't the point of what's being said. It's simply to say that these were willing to forego what we might call the natural pursuit in order for something higher to be pursued. These are they which follow the lamb. That was their heart's pursuit, you see, the lamb. They follow him wherever he goes. They are redeemed from among men. And in their mouth was found no guile. It's a beautiful scene, really, 
that reminds us once again that the Lord's program marches on. That, that not only that, that while it seems like oftentimes we don't win, ultimately the Lord does win. There's one other point that I would make from this particular section of scripture. I take it that the things that we see in chapter 14 take place in a future day. And it's, it's a challenge to my own heart that if in that day, under those circumstances, this group of people could be loyal and follow the lamb, if they could do it then, well, it doesn't leave any excuse for me now, does it? No matter how bad things get in this world, they followed the lamb wherever he went. And may God help us to see, no matter how difficult and dark things get down here, we, listen to this. These are they, which I take to be very similar to those in chapter 11, they overcame the dragon by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives, even if it meant death. God help us. Nobody wishes these things upon us, but if times get darker and more difficult, oh, to follow the lamb. And to be true to him, when all else around us, the world seems to be going mad like John saw. And so ultimately, we know the end of the book. We know the end of the story. And we know uh, if we're on that side, ultimately, we do win. It just isn't going to be down here. Not now. So I trust it's an encouragement to your hearts to think about some of these things and and uh, thank you again for having me. And I'm not sure now if Matt, uh, how we proceed. You can go ahead and close in prayer. Okay, thank you. Our Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. What a thing to see that lamb standing in the middle of Mount Zion. Uh, if we had been designing things, we'd have probably had some great ferocious beast or some you know, lion or whatever it might have been. But that symbol of a lamb is so suggestive to us because we realize that ultimately the greatest victory that has ever been accomplished is what the Lord Jesus Christ did, not as a gentle lamb that people could admire his docile qualities or any of that, but as a lamb who was slain, a sacrifice to provide a redemption and a satisfaction, a propitiation so that you could be satisfied and our sins could be forgiven. We thank you for that ultimate victory. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And it's not the amount of our faith. It's where that faith trust is placed and in whom it is placed and trusted. And so we thank you again. Help the assembly there, Palms, those folks to know how to carry on in the world in which we're living, Lord, and to navigate the challenging times in which we find ourselves. We give you thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.